We talk about the six things that we look at at TechStars to get into the accelerator, and it's team, 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 market, progress, idea. Uh, team is so important, we say it three times. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Peter Davis, managing partner of Interplay Ventures. On this podcast, I interview innovators about their strategies, industries, and decisions. On today's show, I have David Cohen, the founder and chairman of Techstars. And some people say uh, venture capital doesn't scale, but David Cohen and the Techstars team have demonstrated otherwise. They operate 50 programs a year and invest in an astounding 500 companies every year. Now, when I think of Techstars, I generally think of them as an accelerator, but at their core, they are a new age venture firm. David provides the tips on how to get admitted to the program, how they operate their business, and how they have scaled their investment pl platform. It is absolutely fascinating. I hope you enjoy the chat. This episode is brought to you by Chelsea Capital. Chelsea Capital provides high quality, low cost accounting, tax, CFO, and alternative finance solutions. For those who don't know, alternative finance solutions include venture debt and other forms of non-dilutive capital. They help companies scale their operations while keeping costs low. If you're interested in learning more, visit chelsea.capital. Welcome, David. What's up, Mark? Good to see you. There you are. All right. Um, I'm going to start by doing your bio for you because I'll probably okay. say stuff you would be too polite not to say. And uh, then we can also spend the rest of the time diving into some insights about the industry. So David Cohen doesn't need much in the way of an introduction, folks. He's the founder and managing co-founder and managing partner of Techstars. He co-founded Techstars 14 years ago and has built a behemoth. By the numbers, there's 2.4 thousand companies that have gone through the program. They've received $11.5 billion in funding and are collectively running a market cap of $30 billion. And I have a feeling that's outdated at this point with all this back setting. Um, David has also been an active investor through Techstars Ventures and as an angel. His investments have included 15 unicorns, 15, such as Uber, Twilio, and Sengrid. He's the co-author of Do More Faster, which has been translated into not one, but five languages. What more is there to accomplish? Uh, his best, uh, the best way to find David and, and get kind of connected in with what he's doing is his website, davidgcohen.com. You can find him on Twitter at David Cohen. So David, I don't know what I missed here. I think I, I think got the high level. Yeah. You forgot super good tennis player. Uh, no, oh. not that good. I enjoy <laughs> tennis. That's the only thing I can think of, Mark. You nailed it otherwise. Thanks. Okay. Right on. Anyway, it's obviously awesome background. I'm sure a lot of people are excited to hear you. So um, if you're cool with it, let's jump in. Maybe we start at the top. Would you mind giving us an overview of Techstars just in case someone happens to not know what that is? Sure. Yeah. So Techstars is the worldwide network that helps entrepreneurs succeed. So the way we think about it is that's the product. We want to build a network that we deliver to entrepreneurs in order to help them be successful. And uh, we do have a venture capital platform attached to that. Most people would know us uh, because of the accelerators that we operate. And if you like the term accelerator, you can thank my co-founder, Brad Feld, who coined that term. If you don't like it, you can blame the same person uh, because he came up <laughs> with that word. And now, of course, there are a zillion accelerators, but um, Techstars right. is the original mentorship-driven accelerator, which means we get the community, for example, in Boulder, uh, where it started, of experienced entrepreneurs to help a new generation of entrepreneurs. We fund 10 per year per city uh, in a batch, a class, um, and we put them through a mentorship driven program, help them raise capital, and then they work with us for life. So we do that now about 50 times a year. Um, so that's 500 companies a year in you know Amazing. dozens of markets around the world, I think 16 or 17 countries now. And that's where the the portfolio of I, I never heard it said as two point four thousand. That's an awesome way to say it, because now that you know yeah. it's such a big number, you've got to have a decimal point in there. You, um, and yeah, it's, you can do it's that. A, an amazing portfolio. I wrote it yeah, down as two point four k. You're in the k. 
Awesome. You, you may also know about Startup Weekend, uh, which is another um, uh, event that we run about a thousand times a year around the world. Uh, that's on the Techstars platform as well. So really just trying to help entrepreneurs be successful and the business that we have is one of investing. Got it. And you're investing through the accelerator, obviously, for folks listening. When those companies go through the program, you're investing yeah. in them and that's the, that's the business model. Uh, yes. So that's uh, the first strategy we have as investors is we invest through the accelerator and that's got this 14 year track record of highly consistent performance because it's so diversified as compared to typical venture activity. It tends to perform really consistently uh, and very well uh, because of that diversification and the stage that we enter at. It's essentially angel investing at scale globally. And then we have a second strategy which follows on in companies as they mature and grow, which is you know quite a scalable strategy. So the, the fund on the back, Techstars Ventures, um, how large is that fund at this point? And what rounds do you guys typically um, invest in? Yeah, so we have two strategies. As I mentioned, the Accelerator Fund, uh, which we raise every three years or so. Uh, right now, the scale of that would be about $150 million, uh, every three years or so. And then we have a faster growing uh, and larger um, follow on strategy. So, you know, the way that we do that is not your typical sort of small portfolio approach. We're again, highly diversified, investing into the follow on rounds of many of our companies that are led by other investors. So, uh, if a well known firm or someone comes along and funds one of our companies, we'll participate in that because we have a pro rata. So, Last year, our portfolio raised about three billion. Uh, we are uh, about you know typically six to eight percent shareholder. So you know we're able to deploy a hundred or two hundred million dollars a year at this point that way. That's awesome. Coming back to the accelerator side for a second, and I, I think we'd be remiss not to have this discussion for the benefit of listeners. Why should entrepreneurs apply to TechStars? Kind of underhand lob pitch, so people can get the right answer here. Yeah. Um, thank you for the softball. Yeah, no, it's look, uh, it's a massive accelerator, hence the name uh, at the early stage. And, you know, I think it's to surround yourself with amazing people, right? When we invest in, you know, this, it's so much about the people. And so who can you get around the great people that are starting the company? You, you know, you want to have many people that are well connected to capital customers and talent. And that's what the network brings to you. So, it's this, you know, three month experience of, of really getting two or three years of stuff done. Uh, even if you knew these people, it'd be hard to get so many concentrated meetings with them and so much concentrated feedback. Uh, you're obviously building your network. Techstars is compared to another uh, program or accelerator, you know, very global. So, you know, if you're, you need to do business in Singapore or South Korea or Berlin or Toronto, that's no problem through the network, right? We have the same mentor and alumni presence in those locations. And I think just the track record of, of being able to attract uh, capital to the companies that go through the accelerators, as you mentioned, you know, it's, it's a very um, it's sort of lots of VCs hanging around the hoop, if you will, uh, looking for mm -hmm. deal flow. And I, I think the stat is we're somewhere around one in 20 series A's start with Techstars. So, so investors know to look at Techstars for the next generation of interesting companies. So I think those are some of the reasons primarily about that network value. That's awesome. Um, what percentage of companies coming out of the program uh, receive venture funding? I assume it's quite high. Um, yeah, about 80%. There's, there's some that don't work and there's some that um, you know, choose to bootstrap. Uh, and of the 80%, you know, some of that is, is smaller angel rounds, quarter million, half million. So in the way that you and okay. I would think about it, sort of you know, leading towards a real Series A with strong um, investors, it's, it's more than half. Okay, right on. That's fantastic. Um, and I, I know a lot of people are interested in the program. How hard is it to get in? So if someone's thinking about applying, should they get their yeah, hopes up? Well, yeah, I hope they do. I mean, we, we're running, again, 50 of them a year. So that's 500 companies a year we're going to fund uh, in the world. A lot of them are virtual right now. And, you know, that's a dynamic that's shifted in the world and an opportunity uh, which has been great for getting more people involved uh, from around the world and being more inclusive. There's some really good things associated with that. Um, the hack, I would say, is if you apply uh, to not just apply and if you don't get into the first thing to, to stop, it, it's very rare, actually, the first time somebody applies that they'll get accepted. 
And, you know, Mark Suster famously said, you know, lines, not dots, right? And so that's the same thing we're doing. We're following you and understanding how the business is evolving. Um, so don't be disheartened if the first program you apply to says no. Uh, there are many opportunities, both virtual and in person every year. Any tips for people applying on what they should do with their application to stand out? What's worked best? Um, yeah, I mean, I would think about the application as sort of a binary, you know, or is it interesting or not? And so I, I don't, I think sometimes people can spend a little too much time, you know, trying to get that perfect. Um, you know, I think just saying what you're doing, what your real advantage is, maybe helping us understand the market size, and most importantly, the team. Uh, we, we talk about the six things that we look at at Techstars to get into the accelerator, and it's team, 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 market, progress, idea. Uh, team <laughs> is so important. We say it three times, right? right. And so uh, at, the, at the very earliest stages, right, it's so much about the people and what, what their intrinsic motivation is, uh, what insight or unfair advantage they might be bringing to this market, what experience they might have that, that drives them beyond the spreadsheet that they put together that says it's going to be big. Um, and then we look at market, you know, is it, is it changing, shrinking, growing? All those are good. Uh, static markets, not so interesting usually. Uh, and then progress, you know, we, we believe that entrepreneurs actually do stuff. So to just talk about doing stuff, but not actually have done anything is a bit of a red flag for us. And then idea we put last just to show that it's last. So I would focus on the team uh, in the application uh, as well as why the market is interesting and show us the progress you're making. I think those are the key elements. So uh, I met you, if you recall, in 2008. And at that point, you were already you know, knee deep and on your way with Techstars. So I didn't know your, anything about your life before that point. So I had to go scrub your LinkedIn before this conversation. So if, tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but you're an engineer by training. And if I'm not mistaken, you were running a development shop called Earfeeder, which you sold in 2006 before starting Techstars. Can you explain um, the name Earfeeder? Is that right? <laughs> sure. Yeah, so I, I, I went to school to be a software developer, and that was like the first wave of my career. I, I, I would explain my career as um, you know, software engineer, Right, turned entrepreneur, turned investor. Uh, maybe first angel, then VC investor. Um, so yeah, my background is in technology. I, I still love to code whenever I get a chance. I was never amazing at it, but it to me, it's art. Uh, it's creating something from nothing, which is the same as what investing in startups is or creating a startup. So I love that. Um, Earfeeder was actually a, uh, my second company. Uh, it, was a, it was not a development shop. It was a actual oh, product okay. company. And it would, um, if you remember back in the day, you would have, you know, your iTunes feed and you, you would have the music that you listen to, uh, you would download the physical song. So I, I built a piece of software that would scan your computer, understand what music you loved and then deliver huh. you like concert tickets or new song releases. It was in the very early days of RSS, right? So you could subscribe to a feed. So I was feeding your ear, Mark. That's, that's why I called it ear feeder. Uh, <laughs> it was after my first company, which we had sold to a public company. I was starting to angel invest in that time frame, uh, And then right. I'd do one more before Techstars. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love that. And so why did you decide to start Techstars? Um, you know, I, David Brown, who is one of my co-founders, and, and I were talking about what we wanted to do, to do next, and we knew we wanted to do something together. Um, today, I've been working with David Brown for almost 30 years. So, you know, this wow. is at a point halfway through that where we had done some stuff together. Uh, our and first you guys did the prior had, ventures together? Yeah, we had built a, a company called um, Penpoint Technologies, which we sold to a public company and had a great outcome and, and wanted to do a new thing together. And so we were brainstorming, you know, what, what would we love to do? We had had some luck and, you know, some, some good outcomes. So, you know, we, we knew we wanted to do something that we'd enjoy. Uh, and we just started brainstorming and, you know, we, what we ended up with was this idea of tech stars, which would have two kind of primary benefits from our perspective. Um, one, we really wanted to see Boulder, where we lived, be a better startup community. Um, you know, it was pretty nascent at the time and not a ton of activity. And we thought, what can we do to, to increase the activity here? Uh, because we were doing some angel investing and 
you know, getting on planes all the time and wanted to have more here. Right. And the other was, I thought we felt like at that moment that there was probably a better way to do angel investing. You know, you've heard the old adage that angel investing is a great way to turn a small fortune into an even smaller one. Uh, <laughs> most people don't succeed at angel right. investing. Um, it turns out the trick to succeeding in angel investing is paying attention to where you're entering and doing a lot of it. Um, and so, you know, we thought by funding 10 companies a year, this would be really fun. We'd have a cool summer job and, you know, the rest of the year we could chill out and not, not do much. Ironically today I get on lots of planes, not, not this year, but normally, uh, to travel to, you know, help invest. Uh, but the Boulder startup community is a lot better. So I think that part worked out really well. Now, how did Brad Fell get involved? You mentioned so, David Brown. Um, yeah. So my other two founders are, are Brad Feld um, and Jared Polis. So Jared, uh, if, you, if you might know that name, is the governor here in Colorado. We don't, we don't see him a lot. He was five terms in Congress before that. Uh, but a terrific entrepreneur, um, you know, Blue Mountain greeting cards, if you remember those. Yeah, uh, absolutely. As well as many other companies. Um, and, you know, Brad was someone that I had co-invested with in a couple of angel deals. And so I'd signed the same paperwork. I'd seen his name. I was following his blog, uh, Feld Thoughts. Um, yeah, he was, he was writing about how all this stuff worked. And I was just a fan. And I happened to see that he lived in the same town as me. So when, when I came up with the idea for Techstars, I asked for a 15-minute meeting with Brad. And I, I was given that meeting just four short months later. Uh, just four months later, I was able to get on Brad's calendar. <laughs> And I was like, what, who is this guy? You know, like, and, and now right. I get it, you know, you do too. But back then I didn't get it. Um, and I went in for that meeting and I remember Brad was in a suit, which since that time is the only time I've ever seen him in a suit. I guess he was right. de dealing with LPs that day or something. So Brad's a terrific uh, early stage investor, um, you know, very well known for, for that activity and has a firm called Foundry Group. And I said to Brad in that meeting, Here's a piece of paper. I slid a half folded piece of paper across the table. It had about eight bullet points on it. I said, this is tech stars this is what I want to do. I'm, you know, David Brown and I are putting some money in and we'd love for you to be involved. About 10 minutes into the meeting, Brad said, I'm in, uh, I'll invest Amazing. as long as you're not a crook or a flake. <laughs> and I said, I don't think I'm a crook or a flake. So great. Uh, so we got to know each other over the next few months and he called up Jared Polis and said, Hey, I just met these two guys. I'm investing. You should too. Jared said, okay, I'm in, by the way, what is it? I just invested in. That's how Brad's network works. That's awesome. Uh, right. if he asks you, you better do it before someone else does. And so it was a random meeting where he was just open to randomness and ended up, you know, doing more than just investing and co-founding the company with us. Yeah. And Brad was a very big name already at that point, right? There were. Back then, the, the main social media account was your blog subscribers. And he was yes. always in the top one, two, or three for VCs nationally, right? With felt thoughts. Yes. Uh, if you were reading, you know, AVC by Fred Wilson, and, you know, you, you probably were also reading felt thoughts at that time. And he was very scary to me. You know, I thought, ooh, venture capital, scary person. Uh, but he's just the biggest teddy bear once you get to know him. Right. So I met him once, but I don't know him that well. But yeah, the, I, even on the East Coast, everywhere nationally, big name. Uh, and he's kind of, he, he's been a godfather in many ways, I think, to the industry, right? Like, I think he's, um, his well, involvement whole, what you're doing. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, tell the me. Whole notion of, uh, the whole notion of, of give first, I mean, really, you know, it's, it, Brad would say I didn't invent that either. But if you go into any tech stars office, you know, give first is, is on the wall. That's the hashtag and it's the value that we try to carry. And Brad, Brad really lives that, right? I mean, just again, the random meeting, he'll meet with anybody, help him get started. He didn't know who I was. Um, nobody right. did. Right. And so, awesome. he, you know, he's, he's just someone that can really, um, give first in a very genuine way and not expect anything back. And that's been huge in the industry because I think it's, it's inspired a lot of others to behave that way. When you guys started this, did you expect it to become what it is today? It sounds like it was a couple of buddies doing some angel investing. What happened? Yeah, well, I, this is the story of every company I've ever started. I mean, David Brown wrote a book about our first company, which was a public safety software company. And it was literally called No Vision, All Drive. 
Um, because one day when, when, when we were starting to have some success, we said, I think we could get to 10 employees and a million dollars in revenue. I think we could do that. And that was like, <laughs> you know, mind blowing scale to us. And, you know, Techstars is a similar, I mean, it, it ended up a $50 million a year company, right? That, that we were sold to a public company. So, um, and Techstars was similar. It was really a fun thing to do in the summer to, you know, have an organized way to angel invest with some kind of advantage to bring the talent to Boulder. And, you know, I thought I could have a lot of freedom the other nine months. Um, and then we started getting calls, you know, is what we called pull, right? We weren't pushing tech stars anywhere, but Boston, you know, Y Combinator was there, started around the same time, abandoned it for the Bay Area. Um, now has the story that you have to start your company in the Bay Area, which I find ironic since they didn't. Um, but, you know, Boston was hungry for something. So they called and pulled us and Seattle pulled us and New York pulled us. And, you know, we, we really just felt like, oh, wow, this is a thing people want. Mm -hmm. And so we just leaned into that uh, investing activity and, and building the mentorship across the network over the years. And today, you know, there's 50 of those locations. I think you've had the impact you intended to have in Boulder and a lot of cities. I think, you know, New York had been building for a long time, but when you and I first connected, you were scouting New York, deciding whether or not you were going to do it there. Um, and I feel like Techstars showing up in New York wasn't the beginning of the tech, seek, tech ecosystem by any means. It was 20 years in the making at that point. But it was a churning point. It felt like the inflection moment where it gave an additional level of legitimacy to what was already happening and attracted more talent, more capital. So I, I think you've probably had this very positive impact. You know, they say it's like, uh, you know, countries get to a certain point and McDonald's shows up or that's a way to measure you know, progress. There might be yeah. some tech stars equivalent. Yeah. I mean, it, it reminds me of Matt Mullenweg of WordPress who said, you know, WordPress is an overnight success that took 20 years before anyone knew it existed. And that, right. that's true in, in any startup community too. And New York was definitely already super vibrant, but 2011, uh, when, when we launched there and I lived there for four months during that period. So it was probably just before that, that we first were chatting. And, you know, getting people like you involved, right, and helping out and mentoring. And, you know, we, we actually made a TV show on Bloomberg, right, that showed off the, the tech community of New York. Um, uh, you know, I think it wasn't, it wasn't the catalyst, but it was a thing that might have contributed to sort of people's awareness of what was going on there. And, you know, you had companies that, that you know, got funded through that activity, right, ClassPass, many, many others, right, that were, were sort of what we're seeing today. Uh, right, is, is sort of the digital oceans and companies like that that are IPOing now, right, that the New York tech scene is now known for. It's not unusual anymore. But in 2011, right. there was less of a pace of that. And so maybe we helped put a little bit of a light on it, but it certainly was just, you know, one, one little contribution to the community. What's the main focus of the business now, right? Uh, I know you guys on the, on the incubator accelerator side, um, you guys work with a lot of corporations. I think you have a Barclays accelerator out here. How do the corporations fit in with the program? Because when you guys started, it was just um, you guys, probably some outside capital, I would assume, and the program. How do the corp how did the corporate does the corporate piece fit in? Yeah. So our our business model is that we're investors and we happen to have an operating business that's somewhat, somewhat substantial. Um you know, closing in on a hundred million a year revenue business, right. That supports the, the mm -hmm. large team we have around the world. And a lot of that is working with, with corporate partners. Um, but we think about it as investing activity. So when we work with a corporate partner, we're not, you know, consulting with them. We're building an investment program with them typically, whether that's with Amazon or, you know, Barclays, like you mentioned, there's, there's about 80 of them that we work with now. Uh, and so what we're doing is adding more, uh, of a footprint to help more companies be successful, right? Through the acceleration program and attaching those corporate partners to that network. Because again, the entrepreneurs, as you know, well, need talent, capital, and customers, right? So that can bring some, some capital. It can bring some customers and occasionally some talent. Uh, and you know, it, it is an additive thing to the network. And that's the reason we do it is to scale that first wave of investing activity. So of the 50 accelerators we run around the world, that's, that's half the activity or more at this point. And so that's really allowed mm -hmm. us to grow with a model that's repeatable. But we really think of them as, as invest in, investing partners. They're not quite LPs, 
Uh, it's more sponsorship oriented investing, but they do have an economic upside in it that we manage for them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, without that business, we would just be a bit smaller, but we'd still be scaling the accelerator platform and the follow on platform for the same reasons, uh, because fundamentally we're investors. What's the corporate, um, what's the motivation for the corporations to be involved? Right. Uh, is it innovation in yeah. a box? It's some guy showing his boss that they did something creative or is it, <laughs> are they getting, um, uh, you know, are they, are they getting real innovation that they're acquiring? How, how is it? How, What's the motivation? How is it impacting them? Yeah, so there's, you know, there is an economic motivation in that this actually works, right? I mean, we, we invest in these startups and they produce returns and that's sustainable and valuable, uh, but that's probably not their primary motivation in most cases. They want to be around the innovation. So, you know, we're fortunate to be, you know, first round angel round investors in Uber, for example, and, and for, you know, working with them, they said, you know, we don't want to miss the next one. We want to be friends with the next Uber, right? Not sort of discover mm -hmm. it when it's worth, you know, $16 billion. Um, and by being, you know, by, by sort of giving first, right. As a corporation, by, by saying, you know, Hey, look, maybe we can be a distribution channel for you as Microsoft did for SendGrid early on, for example, right. Because of that relationship, uh, that's helping that startup. It's staying close to them. It gives you the opportunity as a corporation to invest, to acquire, to partner, Right with those companies, and I think even when those things don't work, um, you know that that talent uh, inside that startup could be relevant to what you're doing. Doing it with TechStars is another level of interesting because it's not just an isolated one-off accelerator that you're building. If you are, you know, Amazon and you're interested in in voice, right, or AI, guess what? That's happening in Berlin and Singapore and you know Toronto and Atlanta also. And so now you have exposure to, again, this global network of, of the startup net, this early warning system for, you know, what is the next big thing that you can be part of as, a, as opposed to being pitted against. And I think that's the primary motivation of many of them. Now, there are cases like Cox in Atlanta where they are not as interested in that stuff. They just want Atlanta to be awesome. They want to be a steward of their community and they want to see more startups and they want to help more of them succeed. That's really mission aligned for us. And so partners like that are super amazing, but there are a variety of motivations they have. That's very cool. That's very cool. Um, how do the programs differ when there's a corporation involved? Are they the same thing at their guts and the, the format, or is there a different structure to them? They tend to be um, what we would call verticalized or thematic. Uh, and so, you know, again, I keep using, I use Amazon as example, but um, pick any of them. You know they're interested in in certain specific things, uh, and so you know you're going to have a lot of thematic focus in a program when it has a corporate partner because that's going to be their interest. It'll feel mostly the same. There, we're still you know we run it. It's our team. It's our managing director. We're bringing all the same you know capabilities to the you know, to the accelerator itself. But the investors that are going to be interested are going to be thematic. The other companies in the program are going to be thematic. So it's just going to feel a lot more uh, oriented towards that particular vertical versus, say, Techstars New York or Techstars LA or, or Boston or Boulder, right? Which you're just going to see internet software companies, you know, very broadly, very diversely in that program. Right. Like great, great company, check you're in. Right. Great team, great company, check you're in versus. Yeah. It doesn't have to also sector, be in a space. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And how do you guys manage the program at this scale? How many, how many, uh, you said there's 50 programs. How many cities is that? Is that 20, 30 cities or um, is there one a, program per city? Yeah, it's about 35 to 40. I don't know, somewhere in there. Um, in, in 16 or 17 countries, you know, so some places like New York or LA, right. will have multiple programs, but a lot of them just have one. Um, and, you know, we have a centralized team, the team's, you know, 300 plus at this point uh, globally. And, and a lot of the services, right, the, w the way we think about it is those managing directors are closest to the customer, the entrepreneur, and we're just there mm -hmm. to support those managing directors in those markets. Uh, and we want them focused on finding great companies and helping those companies. We don't want them doing, you know, due diligence, um, you know, background checks. We, we do all that stuff centrally, you know, social media, um, sales, obviously business development, 
Uh, they're right. really focused on the entrepreneurs and the customer and helping them be successful. So it's, it's a support structure for them. Are they, um, wh where do you guys select which companies get in? Is that at the hub at HQ or is that each at, uh, with each local managing director? So there's a, there's a centralized global sourcing uh, component. We, we're seeing 20 to 25,000 companies apply a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that is somewhat centralized so that we can help the entrepreneur again, have a good experience with that because you don't want five different programs reaching out and saying, you know, come to my thing. Right. Uh, and so we coordinate that centrally. And then, um, the managing directors are, are super involved, but mainly with the quality sort of deal flow elements. So, you know, when it gets down to 50 or so for 10 spots, uh, they're meeting all those companies they are going super deep with them. Um, they have a, a local team, uh, we call it a selection or, you know, committee it's, it's helping them decide, uh, the managing director will ultimately make that choice of which 10 companies get in, because again, they're closest to that activity and they are investors. Um, we do have, you know, a, as a, a company and as a platform, we, there are things we don't want to do, uh, obviously. And, and so we, you know, we make sure to see what they are, but primarily that power is pushed out to the individual nodes. When you guys are running the program, um, how consistent are those programs across location? All right, if someone goes into Techstars Berlin versus Atlanta, are they having the same experience? Or is that something that, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a fingerprint of the local MD in each of those? Yeah, the, I, I hope that if you were a mentor, for example, your experience would be fairly similar, right? You'd be using the same systems, you'd, you'd have you know, a similar experience, but for the companies that are there day to day, they're going to feel the local market dynamics. Um, that could be anything from language, right. To customs, mm -hmm. uh, just how things are done in a market. And so it's not, you know, it's not McDonald's and that we say, you know, the French fries have to be exactly this long and this salty, but you know, the logo is, is green. The amount of money is consistent that we invest in every company. The deal is the same globally. Um, right. the playbook is the same, but, but, you know, we, we want those managing directors to, you know, do what's right for the entrepreneurs in each market. And so it'll feel a little bit different, but I think you'd say it's, you know, 70% the same, right? So there's going to be some local flavor. Great. Helpful. Thank you for all that color. Can we switch over to the capital side? How, sure. what do you, how are you guys operating that, right? It sounds like, a, is it mainly pro rata or are you guys looking at, looking to lead rounds um, outside of just you know following on where the accelerator has rights how do you think about the the yep. allocation strategy yep so we have two fund structures um we have an accelerator fund and that accelerator fund does one thing it it, it invests at the accelerator stage and our standard accelerator deal um okay you know it, it'll do 500 deals a year right across the system uh it's highly diversified um, and you know, that is the first like investment we make in every entrepreneurship. If you consider the top one or 2% of what we see in index, sure. Uh, cause we're pretty selective right. of, against of the ones the that get flow, through, but right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's broad exposure is a good way to say it to, you know, if you're interested in, Hey, I, as a bucket, right. And, and so we have LPs that, that see that that performs really well. And unlike most right. venture funds really consistently. Um, they're three-year mm -hmm. funds, and so you're getting three-year vintage exposure. And if you look at, you know, a typical venture fund, it's like one fund is really good, the next fund isn't, right? This is just, hey, it looks like this. It performs really well, really consistently. So that makes that's sense. the first investment we always make. Um, and we don't fund any companies that don't start that way, right? Because that's our advantage. That's our deal flow. It's a lot of companies. It's thousands of companies that are raising follow-on rounds. The, the second strategy is the sort of pro rata capture fund. And so uh, we're never leading. We're never funding something random that didn't start inside one of our accelerators. We're looking at our accelerator companies who will naturally go on and raise more capital. And in a three-year window, there will be, you know, hundreds of rounds a year, right, that occur. Right. Uh, as I mentioned last year, you know, it was $3 billion went into the company, into the portfolio. So we're doing, uh, just taking our existing ownership and maintaining it in the companies that are raising additional capital. So that product really for RLPs is more of an access product. Mm -hmm. If you're 
a high net worth investor that you know wants to get exposure to a broad swath of venture that is co-invested with good funds, it's a good way to do it. Maybe you can't go around and meet every manager and don't want to have so many relationships or you can't get into the very best funds. We can get you co-invested with them. And how do you guys filter uh, within the p- pool of companies that have come out of the Techstars program? How do you select which ones you guys do the pro rata in? What's the, yeah, so, what's the internal so it's, machine it's, for that? Yeah, machine is a good word. I mean, we, so we're pretty different in that we think of that as a system. So, you know, we're not, we're not a manager who's picking. We're a system that you can, you know, sort of invest through in it. So we look at a few specific uh, criteria. So one is, um, you know, if there is a round happening, right, who is involved in that round? Right. Is there, uh, you know, interesting capital involved in that round by interesting. What I mean is it doesn't have to be lead investor, but the set of investors, we can see their track record and in investing in tech stars companies across thousands of data points. We can more broadly mm. see their track record generally. So, mm. you know, am I going to follow on in a couple of angels putting 200 K into a deal, or am I going to follow behind a, w- a well-known set of venture funds with plenty of downstream capital? We're going to prefer mm-hmm. the latter. Um, so that's one criteria. Another is, uh, we can see the objective data. Um, how are they doing as compared to 500 other companies that we're funding this year? You know, what's the revenue growth rate? What's the usage growth rate? We can just objectively compare the portfolio. Um, we don't have to do down rounds, bridge rounds. You know, we're a small investor. We're again, six to 8% of the company. It's not going to harm the company if we participate or not. And so we let somebody else make that decision, uh, which, which really means that we never have to do these sort of save the company rounds. Uh, we don't mm-hmm. have good money flowing after money that's not working. So we're always looking for sort of up rounds and good dynamics. Um, and so it's, it's metrics like this that we're looking at, and it really just scores the company and says, is this one we want to do? So a typical investor would look at the system and say, how do I get the top 10% of this system? Mm-hmm. We're more interested in like the top half because okay. our belief is if you aim at the top 10%, you'll miss a bunch of the big ones. Right. Right. And we have the data to see that the top half looks really good, right? Long term. Right. And so, again, y- your RLPs are really investing in a system and an approach rather than someone mm-hmm. who has a crystal ball and can pick the winners. So it, it sounds like it's highly automated to the extent possible, which makes sense given your background. Um, how big is a team? How many people does it take to actually do this? Because you're still operating at a huge scale. Yeah. How many so, people are involved on this side of the house? So, so the investment strategy team is really where the magic happens. Um, you know, Jason Seats and Nicole Glaros, our chief investment officer and his team, right? That's, that's how do we do this? Um, but really it doesn't work without, you know, sort of legal finance, you know, the back office piece. So, you know, pick your favorite law firm, Wilson, Cincini, Cooley, whoever you want to pick. Um, we, we, we do more financings a year than they do. So we've got our own <laughs> back office. That's pretty substantial. Our, granted, our financings right. are typically smaller dollars, right? But in terms right. of sheer volume, we've got the machinery to manage all of that and, and built our own systems. And so we have an amazing legal team, an amazing finance team. Um, and, and then we have investment managers that, that work with the portfolio that are sort of centralized to help that managing director as those companies mature. Uh, we're generally not taking board seats, right? We let the other investors do that work. Um, we're really just there to support early and then continue investing as we can. So it's it's a substantial kind of infrastructure play, uh, which is what I think prevents yeah. others from being this diversified. Thank you for that. Now you've moved on, uh, not to say you're still not involved with those pieces, but you've layered on a philanthropic component, right? If I'm not, if I'm correct, there's a Techstars Foundation. Yep. Can you tell everybody a little bit about that, what you guys are doing? Sure. So um, about five years ago, um, we created the Techstars Foundation. Uh, you know, like like a lot of people, you know, seeing sort of the moments that were happening and and sort of the inequities um, in venture capital and with entrepreneurship, lack of access, lack of opportunity. You know, seeing the talents equally distributed, but the opportunities not. 
what can we do? And we're big believers in just sort of staying in our swim lane, right? So, you know, rather than trying to do something to, you know, impact, uh, you know, diversity more general, generally, or, you know, police reform, that's not what we're good at or what we do. So we sort of decided, you know, there are a lot of nonprofits that are trying to do this. We had spun out a few, um, Patriot Boot Camp, which helps uh, military veterans, you know, be successful as entrepreneurs. Good example. Um, and we had been funding a few just, you know, here and there, right. Either personally or through the, through the company. Uh, and what we decided is what if we could accelerate the success of other nonprofits, you know, we're pretty good at spotting things with potential that are really young, right. That's, that's mm -hmm. our swim lane. And so we created techstars.org, the techstars foundation, which is a way to accelerate equity. Uh, that's how we talk about it. So if, if there is a nonprofit that's attempting to impact uh, in a scalable way, you know, access and, and inclusion and technology, um, we want to help them be successful. So here's how we do that. Whoever wants to make a grant to that organization can make that grant through the Techstars Foundation, which is a nonprofit. We then amplify that to our 8,000 mentors, you know, tens of thousands of, of entrepreneurs around the world, uh, you know, everyone in the network and say, hey, will you match this? And then we add 5% to that, right, from our own, you know, sort of foundation. And so it's sort of a no-brainer. And, and then when those nonprofits get to a certain level of fundraising, which is just $50,000 total, we accelerate mm -hmm. them for a year. So they then can audit our fundraising classes that are happening in accelerators. We introduce them to specific mentors in the network that can help them. They get an employee who's their, you know, sort of guide uh, to the network. And that then helps them kind of amplify beyond just the capital, uh, which, as you know, is a big part of the value in early stage stuff. So it's, it's been really cool. We've, we've sort of, I think there's 20 or 25 grantees now that have, you know, sort of been through that process and really cool things like the Parentpreneur Foundation, right? Just they're making grants to, you know, black entrepreneurs, uh, really they can spend it on whatever they want, just trying to help them get through stuff. Um, and they're just great organizations to five ventures. You probably know about them and, and others that we've supported pretty early on that have been able to grow. That's awesome. So this has all been wildly successful. And as you alluded in the beginning, more than you had expected. And it's not just tech stars that's been successful. You've been successful. How has this journey changed your life, your perspective, your perception on things? Um, well, that's a good question. I, you know, I do it for the love and it's been that way for a while. Um, you know, I'm now chairman of, of the company and so I'm not an active executive. I recently, uh, led a search for a new CEO, which has been with us for about three months as we're talking today. Mayo Gave, who's you know, dynamite, uh, comes from Compass, uh, been involved in companies that have, are going public or have gone public in the past. And so now I just think of it as I'm supporting her, but it's the same, it's the same love, right? Which is, okay, we're helping 500 new companies a year, uh, you know, be successful, hopefully. How do we make that thousands? How do we make that tens of thousands? Right. Is there a model? Uh, because the venture model really looks for the few unicorns a year that are born. But a lot of our companies, you know, end up selling for 20 million or 50 million or, you know, smaller numbers. And they're very successful too, right? It's life changing for those entrepreneurs. And they go on to found the companies that change the world later. And so, you know, it, for me, it's allowed me to really focus on uh, the things that have impact and not the day to day. Um, which has been really awesome having her in place. And, you know, I get to work on big business development stuff, you know, capital formation stuff. I'm doing more of this kind of stuff, just talking about what we're doing and, and trying to be helpful uh, on Clubhouse or other, you know, podcasts, et cetera. Um, and, and I, you know, I'm able to take it a little bit easier as an honest answer. I, I'm looking forward to being able to start traveling again, but I'm, I'm still full time and I'm super engaged. I love nothing more than sitting down with an entrepreneur who is early and saying, what if we did this, right? How would that look? How would that work? And that to me is just joy and always will be. The space this has given you in your life, I'm reading a little bit between the lines. What are you feeling that with? I'm playing tennis three times a week. 
okay. there you go. I, you know, I've, I've lost probably 40 pounds. Um, that, that is Great. also due to not traveling during the pandemic, you know, how that is. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I get, I, I'm getting a little more time with my kids, but it's, it's, it's 20%, right? It's, it's, you know, I'm at 80% of the speed I was because there's still mm -hmm. plenty to do, but it's just not yeah, 150% all day, mode. every day. Right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I took half an hour and shot hoops with my kid this morning in the driveway. Right. That's like, awesome. I was able to do that during spring break. So, um, you know, I think, I think that's the way I feel it. Have you thought about what's next? Where, where do you see David Cohen in 10 years? Yeah, this is it. Um, I, I don't really have any desire to do anything else. And so I just want to keep helping build the platform and helping entrepreneurs. Uh, I imagine I'll end up on some boards. You know, I, I do some of that now. Um, and those have been good experiences, but you know, I, I have no desire to retire ever. I, I just want to work a little less every year. Um, but this is, you know, this is the thing I want to do, uh, for the rest of my career, if I can. It's a great story. Uh, before I let you go, you've worked with way too many companies. You've seen too much. What's the most important thing you think you've learned about entrepreneurship that you could impart for the audience? There, there's so many Mark, but, um, I guess if I had to pick, one, pick one, uh, like the, the sort of team I, I mentioned earlier, team, 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 right. And it, it, it's so oft repeated and so easy to say, but it, I, you know, I even see it in my own company, right. Um, you know, not being afraid to, to bring in the expert, to have someone smarter than you in a certain area to, to have that experience. And I think I watched so many founding CEOs do that five years later than they should. Um, mm. especially when you're early in your career. And you, you know, you're, you're still learning, right? Uh, you could bring someone in and learn from them, still be really involved. And then your next company is just going to be that much better. Um, and that goes down to the executive team. It goes to your board. I mean, a, lo a lot of CEOs just want to be the smartest person in the room, especially if they're the founder. And I think that's the opposite of what you should do. You should want to be the dumbest person in the room, <laughs> right? In that sense, um, right? That the sort of replace yourself notion doesn't mean you have to leave. I watched Isaac Saldana at SendGrid be on the board all the way through IPO with two other CEOs coming in in the intervening time. It can be done. And I, I just think you just have to be aggressive with having the most amazing people you can get involved with, with what you're doing, be part of that team. That's wonderful. Great advice. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Yeah, good to catch up with you. Thanks for having me. Huge thanks to David Cohen for being on the show today and sharing all of the magic behind Techstars. It's a fascinating story and it's an incredible journey he's been through. If you like what you heard, please hook us up with a like or a five-star review and feel free to share with a friend. You can find me on Twitter at MPD. And to hear more of my conversations with innovators, subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, or any major podcast platform. Just search for Innovation with Mark Peter Davis.